colleagues, welcome, welcome back. Um, we'll just wait till uh, till the panel gets comfortable. Um, so we've now had a chance to listen to all of our uh, invited uh, keynote speakers um, for the on the importance of knowledge equity. And I'd like to invite each panel member to provide the audience with one key message to take away and to kind of set the the frame for this question and answer session. Simone, if you'd like to take us away. Simone? The key message? Yes. Yeah, I think I'll just repeat what I said earlier. I think we need to be absolutely relentlessly collaborative and take it to the level of generosity. And let's please not stop. Let's not think we can't do this because we absolutely can. Speaking during the break to some colleagues who said, okay, how do we take this further? There's so many networks. Can we bring it together? Yes, we'll have a meta network. Mm. And all the people in the room are their doers. None of us are people who just talk and then don't do things. So I have super faith in our potential synergy. So yeah, collaboration, generosity, and let's just make it happen. I was talking to the security guy, Robert, on site here just five minutes ago, and he said, can I quote Thomas Edison to you? And I said, please do. And Thomas Edison apparently has said, I haven't been able to look it up, but I'm sure Robert's right, <laughs> that if you think you've exhausted all opportunities, um, think again, you haven't, find another one. And I think that should be the theme of today. We haven't exhausted all opportunities and there's so much potential here. So maybe that could be my key message. Sure, that's a great one actually for this afternoon's breakouts as well to really explore those opportunities. Thank you. Tawana, if, would you like to give your key message? So I think for me, Netflix is a way of achieving critical mass and scale. And that's one thing universities don't recognize they have because of working in isolation. And so, but if you actually connect them through networks, you achieve the critical mass and scale to achieve the influence and the impact we need to achieve. Yeah, I mean, that multiplication is really important, isn't it? Johan, would you like to? Yes, in the same, in the same direction, actually. We have to collaborate more between funders and universities. We need to uh, take, also take back ownership, I think, of, of publishing. <laughs> take back ownership of academic publishing, scholarly publishing, that I think is also essential. I mean, this, right, this is what Rice Attention is about, but also Diamond Open Access Publishing. It doesn't have to cost as much. We can do this more efficiently. Uh, and we have to make sure that we keep the ownership of, of content, of articles, but also of reviews, of data, and that we don't hand these over to uh, commercial entities. Uh, uh, that's, I think, key in uh, going forward and create a global alliance for this uh, so that we can uh, keep exchanging things much more than before. And Dawn, I'm is Dawn going to appear? Yeah, there she is. Yeah, there she is. <laughs> Dawn, over to you. You're uh, uh, very good to see you all, albeit virtually. And apologies, I can't be there in person. I'm in Bangkok at the moment at the Apex Summit. And actually, there's some very interesting insights coming out of the Apex Summit relevant to um, the Knowledge uh, Equity Network meeting on the summit. And just following on from... Simone's comment, and also, of course, Johan and Tawani have said the same thing around collaboration. Can I just pick up the last point around the call to action? Because collaboration is not about another MOU. Um, collaboration is actually a call to action. We really need to think about a couple of things that have become very um, informative for me today as I'm listening to all the presidents from across the Asia-Pacific Rim, talking about the importance of inclusive growth. And of course, we've got developing nations that are still really struggling with uh, inclusive growth. And as that increases across places like Vietnam and across many parts of Southeast Asia, we need to think about how we collaborate in a way that is really, as I said in my presentation, recognizing and appreciating data sovereignty. I, I agree with um, Johan that, that actually taking back the importance of academics being in control of the publishing is one of the things I also mentioned. Um, but I also think that when we talk about what we are aiming to achieve, and remember UNESCO released a report today, the 
uh, that says that we're in a global higher education crisis. And by 2030, I think that the issues around equity in, in higher education are going to be extremely stark, that we're not going to achieve the goals that the United Nations have set us around sustainable development. And that, that was a report released on World Access to Higher Education Day today. So um, have a look at that. But, but the, actually, one of the things that we really need to focus on, I think, is hope. It's very easy at events like this to slip into fear. Fear is a natural default. It's very comfortable for many, many of us. Actually, effort needs to be put into hope. And that can be achieved through our actions together. Thank you, Dawn. And I think that really sets the tone. Um, so we're opening up for questions now. I believe there's already questions flooding in from all our virtual community. So Emma, would you like to fire away with the first one? Thank you. Yes, we do have quite a few questions coming in. So the first one is from Nick. In the current climate of UK HEI funding, how do you think the Ken objectives will impact financial viability for UK institutions? Shall I take that one? Yes. <laughs> it may sound contradictory, but I'm sure it's going to improve viability. I think the more we compete, the more we are fear-based in our actions, the less um, able we'll be to work together um, and create that financial sustainability that we so need. Because I think one of the reasons UK universities don't have the good press we deserve is that we're not united enough, that we're not, our, our narrative isn't compelling enough. And if, if we become more collaborative, less fear-based, I really liked what Don said, no more fear, please. There's nothing to be fearful of. Um, if, we, if we're truly working together and we can, we can demonstrate that generosity between ourselves towards our local and national communities, um, I think we'll, we'll get more um, financial sustainability and it will be easier for the taxpayer, for the government, for everybody who, who needs universities to see that they do. I think part of the reason we have such bad press is that we've become so inward looking mm. and so competitive and so ungenerous also in supporting each other. And, and yeah, so I'm pretty sure it will help, not hinder. Would any of the other panel like Done with your experience of the UK and overseas? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I've, I've, I've had the privilege of working in higher education in three jurisdictions now across the UK, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it is, of course, funding is an issue across all of those jurisdictions, even though it is different in every one of them. But I, I, but I agree with um, Simone. I think we have to think about uh, what we can do that isn't just tied into funding, and there are multiple things that we can do with our existing, within our existing scope. And the point that Simone just made around our compelling narrative is one that really concerns me. I think we still speak to ourselves as if we're the audience. You know, it's it's instead of we speak about ourselves, and it's as if we're the audience rather than actually creating a narrative that is much more about the external environment. So we're not our own best ambassadors. Other people are probably better ambassadors for us. So I think that's some of the work that we've got to do is around that. But again, that requires us to work in partnership. And I refer back to the Sustainable Development Goals because SDG 17 is probably the key SDG for us all now, share, sharing and working in partnership. And that also mitigates some of the risks around resources and funding. I think Tawana would like to come in on this. Sure. So, so in South Africa, basically, is a system of 26 public universities that are funded through a particular funding system from the government. Then there are small private institutions. But what is most interesting to me, to your point, is that it's easier for me to talk to Leeds than to talk to my colleagues back home. It's simply true. I have partnership with Leeds. I can call and email Simon. A partnership with NYU, Michigan State University, Montpelier. I have more contact with them than with my formal colleagues in the because of a competitive thing that is not helpful to anyone. So let me take science. requires quite a lot of expensive equipment. 
our side of the world, which we have to import from this side of the world, if you like. It would make sense for us to share certain scientific facilities and not try for each institution to have, even when they are less than 50 kilometers apart. Mm. But every university tries to do so. Yeah. Same with library resources, we could have a larger consortium you know, to deal with those big, bad giants that, uh, you know, make us pay for what we produce anyway. <laughs> so, but we don't. So each, li- each university has a library budget that is dwindling because the public funding or government funding oh. is particularly dwindling as well. So at the beginning of COVID, I wrote a paper which our Association of Vice Chancellors actually published. It's called Reimagining Higher Education in South Africa. And I started off saying that we don't have a system we have 26 discrete universities. Can we make a system? My colleague said, brilliant, let's publish it, but that's been the end of the matter. <laughs> Isn't that a shame that uh, it doesn't generate action? Um, but the sharing of resources is really interesting in terms of the story we had at Leeds in terms of opening up resources that were inside the university to other researchers within the university. That, that was a, a journey we had a few years ago that was actually quite difficult. Um, do we have a question in the room? Or I know we have another question online. Tom? Uh, Kurt Rice from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Uh, thank you so much for these fantastic talks this morning. We um, can um, engage in our own idealistic approaches um, as we're encouraged to do by by imagining relentless collaboration, and I'm very much for that. But I was especially engaged um, with a comment of Johans in his talk about uh, the smoke and mirrors of the publishers. And I understand that as an assertion that there are groups deliberately working against equity and knowledge equity. And I wonder if in our discussions around the formation of the Knowledge Equity Network, if we're prepared to respond to a call to action of that type through activism, through calling out those who um, take a position of deliberate opposition to knowledge equity. And I'd be curious to hear the panel's reflections on that. Thank you. Johan, let's go first. I think I would be. I would definitely be in favor of that. <laughs> um, it's it's a difficult. I mean, but it's a difficult thing, right? Because on on the one hand, you have you have these actors that are clearly acting in bad bad faith. I mean, you know, I mean, we had smartphones much faster than we had uh, open access uh, uh, models, right? I mean, it's been six years since Plan has said, look, publishers, you need to um, you need to try. Transition your journals to full open access, so, uh, and in fact, very little has happened. I mean, uh, um, Elsevier is still only publishing twenty percent of their content in open access. I mean, Spring and Nature is a bit better; they are at fifty percent, but uh, but still, I mean, this doesn't go as fast as we. I mean, you know, it's really like you know, in twenty twenty two, you would still be using a rotary phone, you know, <laughs> uh, dialing. So. So yes, I mean, it's, I, I, I think it would probably be a good thing to, uh, to call, call out those, those actors who are not working towards global equity. Exactly how we'll do this is, is not easy because, like I said, many of our researchers are still driven by this um, presti- the prestige that these journals afford. Um, and that will have to change first, I think. And I think there are some hopeful signs there. I mean, there's and just just this these last few months, for instance, there's a coalition for research assessment that has been instituted. There's already 200 institutions that have signed up to that. Coalition as will also be part of that. And I think the change in research assessment and the change, the, the, the fact that we really mean it, that we know we no longer uh, attach importance to the prestige factors like impact factors and and uh, journal names, that that will m- make uh, a, major, a major difference. Also by simply circumventing these, um, these bad actors. I mean, you can, you can call them out. You can also simply um, build a better mousetrap, right? <laughs> build, a, build, build an alternative system for academic publishing that, that we control. 
And that's what I think we are trying to do in Diamond Open Access Publishing. Tawana? Jade, I'd, oh, sorry, go, go. Yes. I'd love to come in on this in a moment. Yeah. Mm. So, so I'd like to, if, if you like to default back to my ordinary career as an academic, which is being a professor of media studies. And what I've, I think is useful to go back into the history of publishing mm -hmm. and media more, and I take publishing as part of the media complex more generally. I think it's a trajectory of the privatization of the public good. Mm -hmm. Because we have to deal with that at the systemic structural level if you don't. What has happened to the history of, pub of the public good? So here in the UK, for example, so those of us who come from Africa, the BBC is an important institution to us. But it's interesting that it is under very severe attack mm. by characters who really want to privatize the BBC. And they've done that over a long time by setting up competitors who are private and begin to set the standard of what, what should be done. How do we recover the public good from its privatization, especially now in the domain of education? Because the, private, uh, the public good is private interest panders to those who have, if you like. It doesn't pander to the general public good. But if education is the sustenance of society and you privatize it in that fashion, you are losing the entire society. Actually, the sustainability of society itself is in question. So actually, this is what we are actually confronting. So recovering that also is recovering the idea of society, not as a conglomeration of private interests. And may the strongest survive. <laughs> Dawn? Thanks, and, and um, what a great question. I'm just following on from the two respondents already. And the first thing I would say, this is, it sounds very simple, but it's highly complex. So the first thing is to do this would have to, if we really think about it, we're saying that different knowledge systems exist and we would have to recognize those different knowledge systems if we're going to democratize access in the way that's just been suggested. That's the first thing I would say. And that's complicated. I know that from being in Australia and New Zealand, where I've just, in my presentation, talked about Mataranga Māori and that knowledge system. The second thing is that I think what is underneath some of this for me is around trust in science. And the uh, where we're seeing the demise of public trust in science and the work that we're doing at the moment on misinformation and disinformation, which actually, of course, also really troubles the notion of equity and inclusivity, whether it is, you know, from a woke lens or what, whatever lens it's from, this whole issue of the infodemic and misinformation and disinformation challenges the notion of trust in science. And what we see, of course, is some sense of the commercialization of, of what you've just heard Tuana re refer to the commodification commodification of public good um, might actually think about this in the context of commercialization of trust you know there's all sorts of ways of looking through this but actually you know somewhere in all of this we're really creative ingenious people and we are graduating ingenious students who are very innovative and together I think that's the other thing we're, we're not it you know, we're not the ones to solve this. We're, together, we are really able to think about ways of solving this. And that's why I think networks are important. So I come back to the Knowledge Equity Network and the summit and the declaration, because networks actually are really important in solving some of these issues. And, it's, and I just want to point out that for me, the response to that problem that we're dealing with, with publishers, is actually quite a complex problem, which is more mirroring some of the issues that we're seeing in society. So through education, we can also tackle some of those things. Can I come in too? Sure. So add? I totally agree with what my three colleagues have said, but I think it's also... I think we can actually fight this through multiple different routes. We've already heard a few in the answer to Kurt's question, but I think another one is university leaders. Um, I think we're un sometimes unthinkingly encouraging our colleagues to focus so much on publishing. 
the reason they're doing it and they're not aware of other ways of doing it. So I think your presentation really opened my eyes to how we can encourage colleagues to publish differently. It's because their career is built on it. For many of our early career researchers, publishing in prestigious journals with impact factors of you know, the highest, highest possible, they know that that defines their career paths. So if we keep doing that, if we basically leave it to journals and funders to decide on the careers of our own early career and mid-career and late career researchers. We're fe we keep feeding that system. So, so as leaders, we also need to think of the incentives we put in front of our colleagues and how we define their career paths. And if we don't encourage uh, societal outreach, if we don't encourage other ways of, of, of building your career, if we don't encourage really great teaching and, and working with students, if we only focus on getting the, the funding in and publishing in high impact journals, which we all keep doing, whether we want it or not, then it's going to be much harder to take the power away from the publishers. Because of course, it's insane that we're paying for the research, we're paying for the manuscripts, we're paying <laughs> for publishing them because we're actually working as peer reviewers and we're helping the publishers. And then we also pay to get the manuscripts back into our libraries. I mean, who, who has thought this up? Mm. But of course, the fact that we we are doing it ourselves, it, it, we can also undo it. But we need to do it together, because if it's only a small group of universities, of course, where our own staff will say, "I'm not going to do that," because at the University of Leeds, it's okay. But if I want to go to mm. University X somewhere else, I'm going to be in trouble. So we need to start. There needs to be a group of four four front runners who say no more, and we want to have different career paths for our young researchers. And it's happening. There's a whole movement now in the Netherlands called Reward and Recognition, which is which is also um, uh, endorsed by the Dutch National Funding Agency, UKRI, are thinking about this. And again, it's where all the brain power that we have here, if it comes together, we can think of really clever and, and very obvious ways to cut off the monopoly, the power of the, the funders, because they're just using our own... Um, yeah, tendency to want to compete and publish and show how great we are and then go up in the rankings. We've built our own nightmare in many ways and we can also unbuild it. Yeah. We can start today. To one of those concluding thoughts. Yeah, so we are missy if we don't also talk about the missed opportunity and how we recover that of the digital turn or the digital transformations. Because here is the paradox <laughs> that we have in the world today. We now know much more about everything, including climate change. And we now have digital platforms which potentially are open for dissemination of this information. Earlier, earlier point refers, who has captured the, the, the digital transformations best? It's the commercial interest, right? But remember that the digital platforms, the internet, were built with public money as well. So, but also, who has also captured the digital platforms and digital trends? The disinformers, the liars, the fake news people and the misinformation people. Why is it not possible for those who are publicly oriented for the public good to take advantage of the potential of the digital platforms to disseminate that which we not much more know, know about, whether it's whatever pandemic or green challenges does. That's the paradox of the world. That I think that the intentional leadership and strategic leadership and disrupting the old models, just like the people do disinformation have done, that they've captured the space, set themselves up as people produce alternative facts and disseminate them very fast. I mean, COVID showed that, you know, the skeptics and, and others were very fast on, on WhatsApp and enlisted all of us to share it globally <coughs> and as these things were. So, so there is an opportunity there. And again, goes back to our, you know, recovering our legitimacy as institutions of the public good. Thank you. So... Virtually, we have five in the queue, so we're going to go with the virtual, but, um, you know, this isn't a competition, but I know Louise <laughs> is, is coming next. Thank you. So following on from that, um, in the declaration, there is a commitment to the global goal of at least 90% of new research outputs being freely accessible to all by 2030. So this is a two-part question. How do you see this target being quantified? And is there a danger we might look to an external ranking measure of open access that is too focused on <laughs> outputs indexed by proprietary databases? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, there is that danger, yes. 
Who wants to go wants first to go. on that one? Hard one. <laughs> well, I, 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 I certainly don't think we should go by uh, external uh, proprietors to controlling that, that kind of message. I, I, I'm... I wish it were possible to, to go to 90% by 2030. I, I don't see it happening. I mean, if you look, look at, looked at my slide, for instance, I mean, you know, that's, that's only on, under the most optimi optimistic scenario um, that that would happen. It could happen, of course. I mean, if, you, if all the universities were to implement the rights retention strategy, for instance, you could, you could achieve 90% of open access via via repositories. You could. And those those publishers who don't want the the articles that carry the right uh, the CC BY license, well, that's too bad for them. Um, but it, but that, that that takes a lot of that, that takes a lot of coordination, right? Mm -hmm. At the same time, I mean, who would have thought even two years ago that so many universities in the UK would be adopting the right, right to, uh, rights retention policy? So many things are possible. I mean, and we have to hope. We yeah, uh, exactly. have to hope, and we have to believe in. Well, how do you call it? Radical collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> so what I was going to say is that for me, is sometimes, yes, I agree. Behind your question is the obsession with the target, but and then not doing certain things. For me, I like the concept of a sustained pathway towards that. So I would trade off not reaching the goal 90% by 2030, but there's a sustained momentum, <coughs> and sustainable, sustained and sustainable pathway to actually reaching that goal in the future. Because I think that is what you, you just said now, is that mm. we need, um, again, critical mass of people joining this movement. Mm. And you know, sure, that it might not be 2030, might be 2035, but that is the new norm, if you like, that everybody's working towards. Mm. Can, can I comment sure. as well on this, if I can? So um, what I would say is that the first thing is that targets are not necessarily the problem is the way in which they're applied, understood, misinterpreted, and to become obsessed around. Mm -hmm. um, so, so let's not demonize targets completely, because actually, you know, they're important things that have helped us to move to much more gender equity, they've helped us to achieve enormous things um, globally. And so it, it but it's it's what happens to the target, it's what we do with it because the target is an inanimate object. It's only vitalized when we do something with it. But actually, my, my bigger comment is this. As soon as we try to solve the problem, using the same thinking that created it, we're really in trouble, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So what do you want to? No, I think I'm okay. okay. <clears throat> Louise, Tom? Thank you, Louise Bryant, University of Leeds, co-dean with Kendi for, for EDI. Thank you so much for today. It's absolutely joyous. But my question is a little bit about the darker side of human nature. Mm -hmm. So we, we can define colonisation uh, in many ways, but perhaps as the, you know, the theft of resources from other cultures and, uh, and countries. And so there is a, a risk, I think, that Dawn mentioned or touched on. If we open up our knowledge to everybody... <coughs> encourage those from different knowledge systems to share those with us how do we stop the appropriation of that knowledge by those people who are in a more powerful situation Dawn would you like to go yeah I'm happy to start with that because I think look I, I'm, I'm I'm in a very privileged position being in New Zealand because um and having spent time in Australia and um, there are many people who, who have um, Indigenous partners that they work with and are working with Indigenous communities across the globe. Uh, but what's really interesting to me, uh, and Tawana, of course, will comment on this, I'm sure, what's really interesting to me is the way in which we're really now starting to understand data sovereignty, not just as researchers, but actually as communities. And, and it isn't just about cultures and heritage, or environments. It's about resources. It's about, you know, you know, I love that comment about uh, in the question, Louise, about theft of resources, I think you said. I, you know, I think that some of what we've stolen is also imagination. Imagination that's not homogenized, it's different sorts of imagination. I think, you know, we're really working hard 
to rehabilitate those opportunities to generate a kaleidoscope of responses to a whole range of things. Now, it's not easy because we've got a very polarised society in many ways. I think we're seeing more divisions than certainly in my lifetime. We've seen that very stark. And so, you know, I, I, I swing. I'm sat right in the middle of a continuum uh, between being woke and racist. That's what happens when you're a leader. Simone and Toronto know this. <laughs> you know, this is... Uh, but But actually, it's really important to be right in the middle of that and and so I think you know how do we work with this and Simone mentioned this we really have to step up we have a we're in a pr privileged position we have to step up but also we have to get out of our own way because we're part of the problem. So so I think that we did touch on this somewhat uh, earlier on not just using the word decolonial but also talking about other forms of knowledge and the notion, that is where for me the notion of co-creation comes from. So let me give very basic standard examples you all know. Typically in the relations between the global north and the global south in producing science was that the principal researcher is from the global north and the other people fall in as research assistants. But as you know, if you step into another culture, you neither know the language nor the context and all of those things. And it's important about producing knowledge. I think of attaining those, those hierarchies, if you like, of knowledge creation and understanding that there are other forms of knowledge, that people are not just your research subjects, but also they are actually human beings in their own right. It's, be it's the beginning of revaluing our common humanity and producing a new ethics about research, if you like, and then also enriching our, the, the knowledge that we co-create. So, so... And that applies to us as well, even if I come from the communities in Africa where we were colonized. The, now I'm actually part of an elite in a university. When I do the research, the same applies to me, and that I'm going to be talking to a guy who doesn't have the same education as I do. So it's tempting for me to make them the object of my research instead of, if you like, a collaborator in my research. I think that that is part of what this network could actually do feel like disrupting the hierarchies without denying that clearly by getting an education and being a professor, I know much more and I know I can systemize knowledge in particular forms, but I'm not the only source of knowledge. Can I add, Jan? Sure. Yeah, I, th I think this is really about, Louise, I think you're right to bring this up, but for me, sort of cultural appropriation is on the spectrum of finally listening, understanding other voices. And it's something, of course, we should try to avoid because it has its own dark side. But I think it's better than not listening at all and, and creating that huge divide. And if I can use an example from my own research background, for many years I was a researcher in maternal and child health. And in the Netherlands, I actually studied home births and giving women who were pregnant and, and who were laboring more power and more of a voice. And it was fascinating to see how difficult it is to do that because everywhere, including in the Netherlands, obstetricians really are the powerful voices. They have the most money. They have the research funding. They're the academics. Midwives are often very marginalized as really important professionals. And looking at, at the side effects of, of um, um, labor outcomes that no one wants, like you know, neonatal mortality, babies dying, the whole narrative was driven by obstetricians. And you see it in the UK at the moment, where the story is that the midwives are really poor at giving support. Every woman should be seen by an obstetrician. You can see the medical interventions going up. And the women's voices were nowhere. And we all know that a very medicalized birth actually is really traumatizing for women. The percentage of women who actually have post uh, traumatic stress disorder because of what they're going through in labor is somewhere around 20% and it goes up as medical interventions go up and as women lose their voices and are just basically <laughs> the birthing machines and the obstetrician is doing the delivery. And just to, to bring women's voices into that debate and make them tell their stories and make them not the passive recipients of the superior care by obstetricians. It was such an uphill battle. And the research that's being done in the Netherlands, in the UK at the moment, still completely denies 
the woman's voice to come in. It's all about the adverse outcomes, the, the baby's health, and there's nothing about how women feel. And women, of course, are, are the mothers too. And we also know that if women are postpartum depressed or traumatized, they're unable to deliver really good care and be the, the mothers that they need to be. So we're, we're bringing generations of babies into the world who are simply not given the care that they deserve because we don't listen to women's voices. So I think that's another example of where as researchers, we need to indeed not think that we know the answers, but bring the populations in, let their voices be heard. So it's a very small scale example of this whole idea of sort of superior knowledge. We know what you think, we know what's good for you. So I think we need to think about different knowledge production and how to bring the voices out, whether it's Maori um, colleagues in, in universities in New Zealand or birthing women whose voices are simply not being heard. But it just it needs make, we need to think differently about what's important in research and what's important in the outcomes and how we can actually really be caring and compassionate in everything we do. Going to take one more online and then I'm going to. Thank you. I've tried to find one I think might be quite an easy one, but maybe not. <laughs> um, so we focused a lot on the role of funders and researchers up to now, but how do you also see the role of our students in these transformative processes? Mm. Can I can I yeah. start? It's a it's a wonderful question, and thanks to whoever asked it because it's really great. I think students are at the heart of this and students want us to invite them into their own teaching and learning. They want to be part of an active environment. They want to put their voices in. They're begging us to do more transdisciplinary teaching around the big topics of today, whether it's climate change or poverty or health issues. And we're not listening to them enough. We're still teaching from our superior knowledge that we're the professor so we know what we're saying. And we're using them as sort of passive receptacles of that superior knowledge. And there's a lot of research actually showing that students pass their exams when they're being treated like that, but they don't retain the knowledge. It's gone within 48 hours after passing multiple choice exams with flying colors. And we don't equip them with the skills that they need to actually hit the ground running when they enter into the workforce. So absolutely, we need to work with our students. We need to bring their voices in. We need to also get rid of that idea that we're the teachers there, the students, sort of this, this power imbalance, and really work together with them. So students as partners will also make it much easier to use our impact in society to create research that partners with our local communities. Because we often also don't use our students' backgrounds enough. We don't understand that their lived experiences can actually enter into the research we're doing. So research-led teaching needs to be more than we have a researcher who talks about their research in their teaching. We really need to create that cycle there too. And it's another very powerful intervention that we can use as a network that we're not using enough. So, so at the university, we're grappling with a notion which is in our strategic plan called inquiry-led learning. And this is almost similar to what you described, that inquiry-led learning, that a good proportion of the, the, the quote-unquote lecturing, the standard one with the professor standing there and imparting knowledge, needs to go in favor of the professor setting up possibility of particular kinds of challenges and asking students to work together in order to... Because typically, you're supposed to be inquisitive at a university, but the old traditional model, the tabula rasa one, Actually, it does not allow for inquiry. You imbibe what you get from the professors. So what we've done also in the university is to create what we call social learning spaces, where it's not arranged like this. It's actually arranged very radically differently from this. And the professor, in a sense, goes animating conversations between different groups, and then they are quote-unquote uh, report picks. We think that the digital technologies actually open up for such inquiry-led learning and the reordering of the classroom. So recently I had to explain this to a donor here in the UK because I wanted a set of lecture rooms in our faculty of vet sciences to be redesigned. And with this design that encourages actually ripping up these seats and putting them into, group, into groups. And the donor wanted to know why do it that way. I said, think about it this way, because I know the donor from the past, they like art. 
that the professor is now a curator more than if you like the person who gives knowledge. What a curator <laughs> does is they put up an experience and the people come to the art gallery, in a sense, make sense of what the story is in the gallery, if you like. So that, but of course, it's not totally, the professor still is one who selects what is to be curated. So I think now we should begin to think about curating forms of knowledge rather than imparting forms of knowledge and then testing them for, for, for that. And then as I says, what graduate attributes do we want? And critical, in, critical uh, inquiry-led learning, you think of critical thinking, negotiation, appreciating diversity, appreciation com co complexity, developing resilience, and that cannot just be imparted in, the, in, in that way. So a problem-solving culture, if you like, could, could help in that, in that space. That's what we're at least trying to experiment with. So less uh, for summative uh, uh, assessment and more, you know, more exploratory assessment. Yeah. yeah, I've been listening to the responses to those two last questions and the one on colonization as well. And um, what I'm thinking about is power. And both of the uh, questions actually require in response a reconceptualization of power. So the first one requires us, which is what's happening in New Zealand, co-governance. Very uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. And, and the second one in response to our students, you know, it's not just about co-creation, because what you've just said, Tuan, is quite interesting. The professor still decides what is curated, okay? Not suggesting that's right or wrong. We still have to get through discipline knowledge. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, our students won't achieve the competencies and the base they need. But how, how does that happen? And with our communities or not with our communities? So it does really bring up to, uh, to the fore, I think, issues of power. And, and I think we, we struggle with that. Our colleagues struggle with that. Our faculty struggle with that. Um, we have time for one final question. In fact, we're just slightly over, so. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we are Maria Jose and Javier from University of Salamanca in Spain. Uh, sorry, guys, for asking a question during the break time. Uh, <laughs> we have so many ideas and so many questions, and, but we are uh, thinking about what he has mentioned before regarding that we have to win if we want to get what we want. Uh, we want to call or we want to ask you guys from countries with a longer experience suffering the pressure of publishing rankings, uh, what kind of incentives are feasible and useful to counterbalance uh, the incentives that we as individuals or as research groups receive from publishers, ministry, the university, uh, because in our system it's very strict. You have to uh, you have to pass four evaluations nationally by the ministry four times in your life if you want to promote. And this determines you as researcher, your group, your faculty, and university. So we believe into this, but we need more people on board who either doesn't believe or perceive that they cannot believe. So how can we really uh, motivate them with something that is recognized? Thank you. Who wants to go It's a big in? question. It is. <laughs> yeah, may maybe we should take it into one of the breakout sessions this afternoon. It's, it's a really pivotal, very big question, and I think there are multiple answers, and some I think have already been provided earlier. Yes. But thank you for that question. Yeah, maybe we should just keep it and take it to the afternoon session. So, so in our system, what has been, and at our university, we are talking a lot about transdisciplinary research. And that question has come up multiple times. That the current system, the national system particularly, doesn't, our, there's a national rating system in South Africa, A, B, C, D, and Y, and P for researchers. Now, it's only a South African system, but it, it uh, valorizes being a specialist almost in a narrow area, whereas transdisciplinarity wants to cut across. Fortunately, we've been in conversation with the National Research Foundation <laughs> to begin to incentivize transdisciplinary research. It fits in with the governmental notion also of that transdisciplinary research is more about societal impact. Of course, governments want societal impact because of the election cycle as well. So there is a coincidence of interest there. But there's no figuring out how this is going to work. And heads of departments still say to a person, focus, focus, focus. And then that's how you get your, 
your tenure, and that's how you are promoted that way. So it's a system in flux. So I agree with Simon. Let's let's build the new system, if you like. Yeah. Johan, can you? Yeah, my, my one comment on it, because I know you're going to take it to the breakouts, and I won't be around, is that you know universities are, have, I think, re-established what their purpose is about post the pandemic. And, uh, and I think we always need to hold that sense of purpose in mind when we're looking at the systems of incentives that we develop to achieve the purpose. Uh, maybe that's just a, a, you know, a comment running into the sessions this afternoon. I'm sorry, I can't be with you. I think that's a great closing, yeah. actually, for yeah. this session. Let's keep Are the sense okay? of purpose in mind and then build the systems around that. Mm. Okay, so thank you for all your thoughts, uh, all your questions, which were challenging. We didn't get to all of them from online, but uh, we will be keeping them and, and, and making sure that we can try and respond to them after the event.